All right, welcome everybody. You are in the right place for the How the Fight for 15 Wins webinar um, being hosted by Stand.Earth. I'm Anne from Stand.Earth and we have three wonderful presenters from the Fight for 15. So we have with us today, Kendall Fells. Kendall is the National Organizing Director for the Fight for 15. He's uh, trained a team of new community organizers that helped pull off the first ever fast food strike in New York City in November uh, 2012. Months later, he helped organize the second New York City strike with twice as many workers as the initial walkout. The strike sparked a movement that has spread to 190 cities around the country and nearly three dozen countries around the world. And Kendall, thank you for being with us today. I'm also going to introduce Francis Holmes. Francis is a McDonald's striker and a St. Louis Fight for 15 leader. Francis has worked at McDonald's for over a year. She used to work cleaning the AT&T building in the Scott Trade Center for 11 years before she lost her job there. This is her first non-union job. Her mother is 84 years old and she helps um, support her. She's got two grown kids and six grandkids and she wants to help support, and, um, support them in their growing up and their lives. And um, I want to, she also went to um, uh, a couple of years of school at SLU and is interested in um, becoming a lawyer, but has found it um, to, be, to be challenging while also raising kids. And among Francis's skills is getting everyone in her store to walk out on strikes. And we're gonna hear more from Francis in just a minute about how she makes that work. Um, we have Angie Godoy, who is a McDonald's worker um, and she's an LA Fight for 15 leader. She's a member of the National Organizing Committee. Angie has worked at McDonald's for several years and is currently going to college. She's been a leader in the LA Fight for 15 and has organized dozens of her coworkers on multiple strikes. Angie has built the movement beyond the US, helping win a historic victory against zero hour contracts in New Zealand and meeting with European elected officials around these issues. And she lives with her mom and her two siblings. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for today. And I also wanna say thank you to some of the folks from the, um, the fight who are behind the scenes, um, to Kyle and to Emily and Shannon for helping make all of this happen today. And so, um, with that, we're uh, going to start off. We'll start off with Kendall, and then we'll hear from Francis and Angie. So, okay, great. Um, and first off, just thank you for having uh, having a campaign on. I didn't get a chance to say hey to Angie. Hey, Angie, and uh, hey to Francis in St. Louis. Um, look, I just wanted to just give some context to uh, you know why we're on this uh, webinar, where this cam campaign came from. So back in 2012 there was a uh, community organization, NYCC in New York, that was out uh, doing canvassing. And, you know, they, they were canvassing low-wage workers. And what they found out is that fast food workers uh, couldn't have the conversation about affordable housing uh, that the organization was trying to have because they were making so little money and had so many issues inside of the store. Uh, you know, I was sent out to New York uh, to start to meet with these workers because they had so many issues. And really what came out is that you know you have workers who are working in these stores anywhere from one year to 10 years to 20 years in the same store they were all making seven dollars and 25 cent you have workers who were being fired uh for anything literally there was a woman at the meeting who got fired for eating a chicken nugget uh because she was starving they fired her another woman in the meeting had gotten fired because she drank water out of a, a medium cup instead of a small water cup uh, you know, and they they just had no real recourse for issues inside the store. They had no way to get raises. And frankly, they were making seven dollars and twenty five cents in New York City. So a lot of them were living in homeless shelters. They were sleeping in parks. They were sleeping in their cars. Uh, they were couch surfing. Uh, and, you know, they were workers who have real issues. And, uh, you know, come to find out, you know, in New York and across the country, fast food is one of the fastest growing industries and the country. So when we got those workers together, those workers were ready to take action. Uh, November of 2012 and 200 of them ended up going on strike in New York City. Uh, it is worth saying that at the time, these workers had two demands. One demand was $15 an hour. They were making $7 and 25 cents. And these workers are the ones who created the $15 demand. The way that they created that demand is they thought that $15 might just be enough for them to be able to pay their rent, pay for food, and put food, and put clothing on their back, just the necessities of life. Uh, and that's how they came with 15. And the union 
was a way for them to have a voice on the job, deal with unfair fi uh, firings, deal with uh, disrespectful managers, deal with all the up, deal with being burned on a job, the sexual harassment, all the issues that were happening inside the store that they had no recourse for. They wanted a union so they could have a voice on the job. And obviously, this was New York City where workers were just a lot more familiar with unions and being in an organization and workers having a voice. So when people started to hear about these workers uh, thinking about going on strike, people literally thought it was the craziest thing they had ever heard of. Uh, the idea that a fast food worker who could get fired for anything who uh, would actually go on strike, meaning they're not in a union, they're not going to show up to work, all of them together don't show up to work, and then they show up in front of the store with like 500, 700 people with signs saying we deserve $15 an hour and we deserve an organization so we can have a voice on a job. So it took a lot of courage for people to walk off the job. And, you know, people who knew about it thought that it was pointless. Fast food workers would never get a union. $15 was too, was too much and that a fast food worker would never uh, never make $15. And people actually thought that all these workers would get fired. So, you know, 200 workers went on strike in November 29th of 2012. It ended up sparking a movement that went from New York City in November of 2012. That was one city. By the end of 2013, we were in 100 cities. Uh, across the U.S. By the end of 2014, we were in 190 cities, plus we had gone global. By the end of 2015, we were in 270 cities in the U.S. And then the strike that we just did this year, uh, April of 2016, we had 320 cities. We're now not only just fast food workers, but fast food workers leading, uh, you know, now joined by home care workers, child care workers, higher ed, uh, convenience store workers, gas station workers, etc. These workers have literally sparked the biggest uh, movement of low wage workers that the country has ever seen. So on top of just the actual growth uh, of the fast food strike, so more fast food workers going on strike in more cities, you have more industries of workers who are involved. Almost every major low wage industry of worker is now involved in a fight for 15. And then these workers have grown these huge coalitions in their cities coalitions that are uh, built of unions, built of pastors, community leaders, community organizations, community residents, etc. And these are the people who walk these workers back into work to make sure they get back safe. They join them on the strike line because they understand uh, the impact on the community. When workers make more money, they have more money to spend in their community uh, and stores end up hiring more staff and uh, people have safer communities, etc. So they built, we built these coalitions uh, in all of these cities. And then we have probably at this point over 100 national partners who are engaged on various levels and trying to help these workers uh, in their fight. And this fight is really against the fast food industry, but McDonald's specifically, because McDonald's is the leader of the industry. Uh, McDonald's has the ability to lead not only other fast food companies, but company, uh, other com private companies in a broad sense. They're the second largest private employer. Other companies follow behind their practices. Uh, and, you know, to the point of these workers being crazy when this campaign started, uh, let's just talk about, let me quickly just go through some of the victories uh, that these workers have been able to create. I would say the top line, uh, Governor Cuomo, the governor of New York State, who it was hard to tell where Governor Cuomo stood on his campaign back in November of 2012 when people were, were very skeptical. Next thing you know, Governor Cuomo, a couple of years after these fast food workers go on strike, he creates, he blows the dust off this antiquated system called the wage board uh, that no one had really ever heard of. Next thing you know, 180 to 200,000 fast food workers in New York State have $15. Uh, not too long after that, we won $15 minimum wage across the state of California after winning it in, in multiple cities. We won $15 the you know, same day or the next day in New York State. Uh, private employer, UPMC, the largest private employer in Pennsylvania, uh, went to $15 uh, voluntarily. So you had, uh, and between New York, Pennsylvania, and California, in about a week, you had 10 million workers on, on a path to $15. And with minimum wages that have raised across the country in places like Chicago, another top line, you know, Rahm Emanuel, someone who's never really been a supporter of workers getting higher wages. He raised the minimum wage not to 15, but to 13. The difference is Rahm Emanuel actually campaigned off a $13 an hour minimum wage in order to win uh, his last mm -hmm. election. And now uh, folks in Chicago are on their way to 13, which is a lot further than they were um, prior to. 
you know, and then I think, you know, it's worth noting just the, the effect on the overall politics of the country. If, if people have been following the presidential uh, election closely, all the presidential uh, candidates on the uh, Democratic side were in support of 15, and all the, the Republican candidates at some point have been questioned about income inequality or about higher wages or specifically about uh, the fight for 15 and what workers are out doing in the streets. Uh, so I, I would just say that, you know, the, the coalitions these workers have built with unions, uh, with community groups, with churches, but also with uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, with the Ferguson Commission and all of these different racial justice immigration groups, uh, it has birthed a movement now throughout the country that spans not only 320 cities across the U.S., but also in, now in the 40 countries around the globe. Uh, and, you know, uh, companies like Facebook and Aetna and Nationwide Insurance. And now uh, I just heard that uh, uh, in Canada, a province just went, and I think it's Alberta, just went to $15 yesterday. So you just have all these $15 an hour minimum wages popping up. You have all these companies going to 15 voluntarily. You have uh, the unusual suspects of politicians that are figuring out how to get behind these workers and these huge coalitions that these workers have built. And I'm just noting that all of this started off in New York City with 200 workers who were called crazy when they walked out the job for $15 in a union. And now we have leaders like Francis and like Angie who are leading essentially the biggest movement of low wage workers uh, that, that the country's seen in at least 75 to 100 years. Terrific. And Kendall, let me just ask you one question before, um, before our next panelist. So when you were helping organize uh, the first protest with 200 people, do, do you have any idea how very big this could get? And, and if so, so how did, you know, what did you see making the difference that you knew this is, this is big deal now, but it's going to get really huge? Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I couldn't say that I, you know, I could have uh, known at that point that this would end up being as big as it is now. But what was clear was that uh, these workers, you know, when I, when, honestly, when I got to New York, I actually thought that I was going to be in a room with a lot of 16 year old, 17 year old, you know, like teenagers. When I got there, the room was packed with people who were like 25, 35, 45, even 55 years old. Uh, and this is a room with, you know, at one point 40, another point 80, another point probably 150 workers. Uh, and all of these workers overwhelmingly are over the age of 30. And so I had no idea that it would be this big, but I think that what I did know at that point was, was that the workers were extremely upset. They were willing to do whatever it took to make their point. And when they took the strike vote and it was unanimous that they were gonna walk off the job, even with their coworkers, family members, and anybody who knew about it calling them crazy, I knew that we had a shot because when workers are willing to do whatever it takes to win, then you always have a shot at building uh, something real and something that could be sustained. Uh, and I, I just would say that, you know, the workers have taken this fight into their hands and they are the reason that this campaign has gone so far because they are so brave and they are so willing to go on strike and they are willing to lose that pay and they are willing to take on the second largest private employer. And frankly, they're willing to get out there and tell their personal stories about living in homeless shelters and not being able to feed their children, not eating sometimes so that their children can eat, sometimes walking one hour, two hour, three hours to work. Uh, and just, you know, it, it's hard to tell those stories, but those have been the stories that have captured the hearts and minds uh, of Americans and, and uh, folks in other countries. And that's why this movement has, has gotten so big and why they have so much support right now. Fantastic. Kendall, thank you so much. Um, we're going to bring up Francis. There you Hello. go. <laughs> hey, Francis. Hi. Hi. Okay. So. My name is Frances, and I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, born and raised here. Uh, I'm a high school graduate, graduated a little, a little college. I, I wanted to be a lawyer, but it was hard to try to pay for school and raise my two children. So that only lasted like a year, maybe two semesters. So I didn't come, didn't get to complete it. I, I had to go to work and raise my two children. I come from a large family. I have uh, younger siblings. I have three brothers, three sisters, 
five brothers, and um, came up with both of my parents in the household, not knowing that they were struggling because we never lived where, like, what you would call in Missouri, where the poor people live, the project. We never lived in the projects. We always had a home. So I, I never knew that we, we were struggling until I got old enough, started my family, to figure out that my parents were really struggling. So that made me, um, that gave me a little push to stroke, I mean, to, you know, to try to survive with my two children. So, and then we just wanna, I just want to tell you a little about what it was back then. Um, our mortgage for our home was like $98.69 a month for a four bedroom house. I live now in a one bedroom apartment and my rent is 706. Mm -hmm. I just got lucky and got that. I guess I haven't they make some weeks that I've been there. So before that, I was really struggling. I stayed in a board house. I lived there for over a year and a half. I lived in the, in the board house for like over a year and a half. So that was uh, a struggle for me. It was a place where my family couldn't really come and visit, couldn't see my grandkids, really. They couldn't come there to spend time with me. I couldn't see my uh, kids really living there. It was like a fee for the grandkids to stay overnight, stuff which I couldn't afford. So I worked McDonald's, and at McDonald's is the second largest employer in the United States. So I, I mean, I should be comfortable within my life situation, which I'm not. If I was comfortable, I don't think we all were comfortable. I don't think any of us would be here doing this webinar today. It wouldn't be a need for the webinar because we would be okay. We wouldn't have to be out here trying to make this happen or make it happen all across the world. Because some people have gotten it. We oh, we had it here in Missouri. It, like, took it, gave it to us and took it back. So that was like really unfair us give us the minimum wage raise and then like snatch it back actually they took it back like right before minimum wage was supposed to go in before the raise was supposed to go into effect took it back at back i mean night like midnight that night so that wasn't mm -hmm. that was not uh good at all but just a little about me personally and why I'm in the uh, fight for 15. I'm in the fight for 15 because I'm a 53 year old parent and I'm struggling in my life. I mean, it would be easy to go and live with someone and, you know, sleep from couch to couch or anywhere, a relative, a friend, but that's not what I want in my life. So I get out the best I can. I'm uh, in the fight as hard as I can. And we here in St. Louis, we just don't fight. Well, I can't speak for them. I'm going to speak for Francis. <laughs> Francis fight the fight because of the fight, because of the struggle. My oldest grandchild is like, Right, he just turned 16, so he's getting into the workforce. And I don't want my grandson and my other grandchildren to go through the struggles that I've been going through. It's not good. And they are young black men, and they need the support of everybody. I mean, the Fight for 15, the Black Lives Matter, they need everybody's help to make it through from this point to the next point in their lives. Um, my work history. I worked a union job. I used to work for a company called ABM. It was a 
uh, SEIU union was uh, the union that I was in, which supports show me 15 now. And uh, my life was better. I mean, it was a lot better than when I was in a union. So I know what the, what it is to be in a union and the benefits and the better living situation of a union. I've been working for fast food now for uh, two, I want to say two and a half years. I've been in fast food. So I joined the fight to just make things better. It's, it's not, uh, it's not good working for McDonald's. I mean, they are greedy for themselves. It's, they, it's about McDonald's. It's never about the employees. No raises. Well, they do give our raises, five and 10 cents. And that's really nothing when you have to work like four positions within your eight hour shift, you know, I mean, they should really pay us what we worth. People don't think that fast food workers are worth $15 an hour. We're worth that. Everybody wanna say that it's young children that work at McDonald's. It's not, it's, you can barely find a teenager working at McDonald's now. I mean, it's parents, grandparents, it's like older people, and that's who's working these fast food restaurants now. It's not the kids. The kids don't want to do that. That's not what the kids want to do. The kids are doing other things. They're not working too much into fast food. So we're the older people, myself, Francis. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm struggling. So I need. For this webinar to go great, I need people to, you know, know that I am struggling. I'm sitting here in my work uniform, and I just got off of work, but this is very important to me, and I feel like, uh, I just feel like this is a fight for me. I'm, there's nothing else I would rather be doing right now at this point in time in my life but making this movement. This movement is bigger than Martin Luther King's <laughs> movement. We're moving, he was just moving a little in the south. We're moving all over the world. And we need people to know that this is important to us. Not only for us, it should be important to people so that the next generation don't struggle. Everybody wants to know why there's so much crime and things in the street. It's because people don't have any money. If they pay people what they were worth, some of the crimes and all of that would truly gradually go away because people would be able to support themselves. They would be able to take care of home. They wouldn't have to be out there committing crimes to get and do for their families if we were making a living wage. So the last thing I'm going to say in this, uh, at this moment is I want to thank everybody who's uh, out there listening and watching the webinar. And in St. Louis, we have a saying. Our saying is, show me 15. Show me 15 and the union. So I want to thank everybody for listening to me. Thank you, Francis. I've got um, just a couple questions for you real quick before we, yes. before we switch. So um, did you go to a meeting like the one that Kendall described in New York? Did you go to a meeting to, to plan some of the first actions in St. Louis? How did you get involved in the campaign? Um, I got involved um, a young man named... Uh, James Houston came into the McDonald's while working as an organizer. And uh, I, I just want to be honest, like when he first approached me, I was hesitant. I like gave him my phone number, but I never answered. I'm the kind of person who has to 
research and find the answers for myself. But once I did that, once I went on to show me 15 uh, website or whatever, I started looking for James, the man who had originally approached me. And I found him. He came back into my school one day, and I found him and asked him, what can I do? How, what do I do to be in the campaign? And he invited me to a uh, show me 15 leaders meeting. So I went to the meeting, and that was like a year and a half ago, and I've been here ever since. I've been in show me 15 ever since then, and I'm like one of the top leaders here in St. Louis because I live and breathe show me 15. Like I said in my earlier statement, there is nothing else in this world I would rather be doing right now than fighting this fight. And um, Francis, when during the introductions, I was noting that one of the things that you're known for is being able to get everybody in your shop to come out. How do you do that? <laughs> I'm pretty persuasive. <laughs> no, uh, actually, um, it's just that you have to really um, agitate the workers. You have to agitate them with issues that's going on in their lives, what's going on in their world as far as where they're working. And once you get them agitated about what's going on and how they're being mistreated, they pretty much seem to want to make things better for themselves. So I have not only uh, shut down my store, I have shut down, like, maybe two more stores inside my store, recruiting people for the strikes. And we get ready to go on strike, so starting tomorrow, I'm going to, to um, try to start getting people ready for when we get ready to go out for our next action. I'm going to uh, start tomorrow and work till it's time to to uh, do it. And I'll probably bring out me personally. I'll probably have about anywhere from 50 to 75 people out myself, just me alone here in St. Louis. Are any of those people first-time strikers? Uh, yes. Uh, like now, where I work. It's not where I, I was working when I first started the campaign. Uh, where I work now, I work in Western Grove, Missouri, where they it were. It was it's a non, it was a non-active store. So now I have uh, my my store very active. It's like it's only like 15 of us work there, and I'm pretty much going to bring out at least 14 out of the 15 uh, crew members that work there. And can you, um, last question for now, can you tell us when people are going to strike for their first time, how do you how do you get them um, ready to do that if they're nervous about it? Um, well, most people are because the first thing they say is, I'm going to lose my job. That's the first thing a person would say is, are you sure I'm not going to lose my job? No, you have it's your federal right to do a one day strike. It's federal law. So yes, you would not lose your job. You have to I use myself for an example. I let them know how many times I've been on strike and how long I've been working for McDonalds. I haven't been fired. I haven't been recommended. They can't recommend you for going on strike. They can't cut your hours. They can't you know, they can't do any of those things. They can't put you on suspension because you uh, went on strike. That's not happening. If it does, then it's consequences to the owners and, like, managers of the school if they do those things. Okay, great. Thank you, Francis. I'm, Thank you. We'll sit tight. We're going to close your webcam and, and your mic for now, and then we'll bring you back in a minute. Hello. My name is Angie Godoy. Um, I'm from Los Angeles. I'm a college student. I've been working for McDonald's for two years and a half. Um, I make 10 50 an hour. 
Uh, I've been there for two years, like I said. Uh, I've organized my, my store, taking out a little bit over a dozen of my coworkers on strike. I got involved in this campaign uh, a little bit over as, as, I, as soon as I started working at McDonald's. Um, and I joined because at first, the first person I thought of was my mom. You know, she's been working her whole life to support me and my, my two younger siblings. So I started working because I thought I was going to help, but my income wasn't helping at all. And I thought, well, 15 sounds, sounds right for me. And it started more of, of a domestic issue. But slowly, as I got more involved, I started noticing that it wasn't just in my house. It was of a, it was all across my city and the state, you know. And as I got more involved, and I, I, I just noticed it was across our country. <clears throat> and when we when we went on strikes, you would see you would see people from everywhere. And was, it was just something cool, you know. I'm like, oh, I'm. I'm really into it. I I enjoy it. You know, you organize your workers, your co-workers. Not only that, but you get to organize your city too because, you know, like if I'm organizing my co-worker, I'm pretty sure they're going to bring out also their, their, their like sister who also might work at a, another festival. And slowly that's how we started growing. And then you you also see community people coming out. For example, when I, I fasted for 15 days um, last year in April, right after our strike in April, and you you saw people coming everywhere just to support myself and the other women who were fasting. And that, you know, like that that's how it starts up, just by you supporting us. We support you, you support us, and that's how we start connecting with other people. <coughs> Sorry, and it's it's just it's an it's it's an amazing experience how uh, the fight for 15 has impacted my life because for example when I started working at McDonald's I wasn't even thinking about college because I couldn't afford it I was getting paid eight dollars an hour and that couldn't even pay my my phone bill with eight dollars because I still had to give them all food, money for food and for, and for the rent. So it has improved my life and I know if it's improving my life and my home, I'm, I'm sure it's improving many other people's lives as well here in California and in New York and the small victories we've had all across the country. <coughs> Sorry. And um, it's, just, it's just amazing how uh, it's affected everyone. Who, who has who has joined us and who has been part of our movement and who has believed in us. You know, like when we started, people thought we were crazy and we're not crazy. As you could see, we're winning. And, you know, we're, we're always here. We're always here not, like, we make sure that they don't forget that we're not going anywhere. Does that make sense? <laughs> like, um, sorry. It's just when we don't have strikes, we, we do our little, our little action, so we keep people motivated and boosting, you know, like, oh, we're not going anywhere, and show, I'm sure people that we have um, their bags, just like, I would expect, I think on my back if something happened to me, you know, so it's, it's an amazing experience, you know, your, fam your, your family slowly starts growing, you could say, you know, like, when I started, my family was just four of us, and then I have I have Kendall and Francis, who are parts of the country, you know, and just like them, like I am sure I have other people all across the country who have my bag, and I'm, I know I have their bags if something were to happen, you know, and like that's that's the that's the pretty thing, that's the beautiful thing about this movement. Like we may not know each other physically. But we, we know our struggles, you know. Our struggles somehow might be different, but somehow they connect. So I think, like, that's, that's what has motivated me. There's, there's, like, there's just this connection that you connect with people, and 
It's beautiful. Like that's all I could say about that. <clears throat> Angie, this is Anna. Let me let me ask you just to talk about that a little bit. Um, in LA, who are, what are some of the other movements that you're that you're working alongside? Uh, well, we work with, uh, for example, we work with Black Lives Matter. We work with uh, uh, immigration com um, committees, right? And um, well, we work with uh, also farm workers. I don't know if you heard the great victory here in California that the governor just uh, signed their bill for overtime. <coughs> and we, we just have support. We have surgeries come out. Our community, you know, we work with uh, car wash. Uh, workers and unions. So those are some of the some of the movements we work with here in California. And so, are you? Does that mean that you are um, going to each other's actions and um, you know physically supporting? Are you talking together about tactics? Tell us a little bit more about what that working together looks like. Uh, well, yeah, we go to their actions. You know, like. Um, they could have an action here, so some, like, I would go with probably other workers and we'll support them and then they'll support us. We also talk about tactics. Um, we have um, meetings here and there together. When they have a meeting, we go, we were there. We, we get involved with them just like they get involved with us. We also go to, um, for example, on um, at the, earlier this year, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was in January, uh, we had an ice, uh, a nice uh, stay, at, uh, ice stay out of LA. Uh, they had a, a, a huge uh, pro like protest, and we were in front of the uh, detention center. We shut it down for, uh, I think, for like four hours we were there. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Okay, I have one last question for you, and then we'll, we'll open up to questions from the audience. And um, everyone, um, go ahead and find your questions pane, and um, and um, and we'll go ahead and open this up for your questions in just a moment. So, um, um, Angie, you brought up a really good point, which is keeping people um, excited between strikes. And so you said that, that sometimes there are smaller actions and other things that you do. Can you talk about those a little bit more? Uh, yeah, for example, we had uh, one of um, another coworker. She wasn't getting her paid sick days, and um, we had around um, workers in front of her store and um, doing a, like an action until until the manager came out and spoke to us, and we delivered a petition, a box full of petitions signed for her to get um, her hours her. Her paid, her paid sick days because McDonald's wouldn't want to pay them unless she had a doctor's note, and which she did, but they were just, you know, saying that, she, that they couldn't give her her sick her sick days. And uh, the next day, as soon as she walked back to work, they actually paid her her, her paid sick days with with no problem. So sometimes you'll bring a whole bunch of people in support of one one worker at one store and kind of yeah. put put all yeah. of the power behind that. Yeah, well, that, like I said, like that's the beauty, you know, like if there's something that's going to go wrong with, for just one person, we're going to bring as many people as we can because that's what we're here for, to support each other and create this bond, you know, that, and to demonstrate that we're strong and we're going to be stronger and we're just going to grow stronger. <clears throat> Fantastic. Okay, Angie, hold on. I'm going to bring up the other um, webcams, and we'll see the questions that we have from the audience. And I've got a couple more questions, and you guys should also feel free to ask each other questions if, um, if you like. So let's see what we've got in the questions area here. Okay, I see a question from uh, Laura S. and a question from Tiffany K. So I'm going to go ahead and um, start off by opening... Uh, Laura's line. Give me just a minute to do that. It's my co-worker, Laura. Hang on just a second, Laura, and we'll get your line open here. Okay, Laura, it looks like you're on self-mute, too. Let's see if we can open up your line, and there we go. Let's see if we can hear you. Hi, everyone. 
Hi. Hi, Laura. Um, I was wondering if you have any lessons learned from this fight that you'd like to share. Well, that, um, just telling your story and opening up to people, you you build um, relationships with, you know, and like I mentioned before, you, you realize that not only is it your struggle, but it's a lot of people's struggles, and we all, we all connect one way or another, you know, like if it's not like, oh, we're not, we're not able to, to afford to pay rent, or it's just, um, you know, we're slowly winning, we're having these victories, we're connecting, like, you know, that, that's, that's one of the le uh, lessons that I've learned as a person. Anyone else want to jump in on that? Lessons learned, things that maybe have surprised you from from your work with the campaign that you that you carry forward and use use for for the work ahead. Um, uh, unless Francis, you want to go, or you want me to want to go? You can go. Okay. Uh, I, like just to piggyback off of what Angie said, just this idea of focusing on similarities instead of on differences. I think that, you know, when you look at the powers that be and you look at companies like McDonald's, and frankly, you know, most companies around the U.S. and around the world, what, what these companies try to do and the powers that be, whether you're talking about elected officials, uh, powerful companies, et cetera, they try to figure out ways for people to concentrate on their differences. So I should concentrate on the fact that I'm black and that Angie's Latina and that, you know, Francis is a woman, and that I'm a public sector worker, and I'm a private sector worker, and I have a union, but you don't, and I'm part of SEIU, but you're part of the Teamsters. So everything's about concentrating on what's different and the reason for me to stay siloed off and not deal with other people. And I think what a big lesson of the Fight for 15 has been is that focusing on small similarities. The similarity that brings together all of these workers, whether they're Angie and Francis who work in fast food, whether they're workers that are home care workers, child care workers, higher ed workers who have PhDs, uh, um, you know, look, and frankly, a worker in Paris or a worker in uh, Liverpool, what pulls all these workers together are two things. One thing is $15. And it's not about $15, the literal wage of $15, as much as it's about the ambition of having a wage that you can actually get food off of, pay for your rent off of, and get clothes on your back. And then the second part of that, the idea of a union, not in the traditional sense of I'm a trucker, I need to be in the trucker's union, I'm a healthcare worker, I should be in the healthcare worker union, but in the sense of 64 million, about 46% of the workers in the United States of America almost half make less than $15 an hour. So guess what? We're all in the same boat because we all make less than $15. And eat, rather, we're, you know, and that 64 million includes union members and non-union members. Let's just be clear. But it doesn't matter because union members get more power when all 64 million are in an organization. Uh, the workers who are not in the union get more power when all 64 million are in uh, in the same organization and the and raising wages not just for a small nursing home or a small hospital or etc but figuring out how to raise wages statewide industry-wide citywide like this broader thought of thinking this broader way of thinking based off what is similar uh, I think that's just a, a, a big uh, takeaway from this campaign and another thing is simplicity. You know, the simplicity of the message 15 in the union is so simple, it's so simple that it worked and that all these workers were able to get behind it and actually build a movement that uh, people could coalesce around. And, you know, the idea that organizers and staff have to get out the way and let the workers lead. You know, because that's what happened in New York. That's what's happening in our cities. You know, that's why you don't see all of these staff members on here. You see Angie and you see Francis on this webinar. And if you come to anything that has to do with the fight for 15, nine and a half times out of 10, you're going to see workers. So we just had a two-day in Richmond, Virginia, where like 10,000 workers marched on the Robert E. Lee statue. And if you look at the two-day convention, who was on the stage? You saw workers on the stage running the convention, not a staff member in sight, because when you get out the way, 
workers know what they need, they know how to talk to each other, and they know how to get people in the streets. And I will say that. And then just the last piece is people in motion create change. You can think your way, uh, you can think yourself into a headache. You can talk yourself into your horse until you take action and figure out how to put people in the streets behind it. Uh, it's, you're not going to create change, but what history shows us is that when you can put people in the streets and consistently put people in the streets and people are willing to take risks when they're in the streets, you can create change. And I think that, that all of those lessons have just been hammered home even more and more uh, here on this campaign. And just I just have to add in this last piece, like Angie's looking like, here go Kendall on his speech again. <laughs> but just, just this last piece is, you know, these workers are building the 21st century union which is a union that is ex extremely inclusive and a union that is built off the idea that we get in the streets and we create change and we do it in the biggest, baddest way we possibly can. And I think that they're showing not just here in the United States but around the world that this is what works. Not thinking but doing and not thinking small but thinking big, keeping it simple and don't think too much. Sometimes you got to just keep rolling. Terrific. Okay. Um I, hang on one second. We have a few more questions coming in. We're going to do our best to get to them. I know that, Angie, you have to go to work right as we finish, right? Right at the hour? Uh, uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, well, I can leave a little bit after. Okay. I called. Okay, good. I just want to make sure we're not going to cause any trouble. We have Francis just came from work. Angie's going. Um, so uh, they are... <laughs> They are very busy, um, so we want to watch time for them and, and for Kendall and the audience, for everybody. Um, but so it's interesting. Kendall, we have some questions coming in. To speed us up, I'm, I might just rattle some of these questions off. We have questions coming up about the role of um, social media, since you're talking about the importance of people in the streets, but you guys have a great online presence too. Can you talk about that? And then... Everybody, um, I'm going to come back and ask you about some of the props that you use when you're in the street, some of these cool, these weather balloons and these other cool things and, and, um, and how you try to use those to, to um, really help make your visuals even more powerful, the pictures and video from the campaign. But let's start off with the social media piece. So, um, and whoever wants to start off with that, what do you... Um, how do you guys think about the about the online piece of this when when you know that ultimately really getting people out in the streets is so important? Well, um, the internet's always global, you know. Um, so let's say I sh share a tweet and it has the hashtag. Make sure if you always if you are gonna tweet about us, use our hashtag five for fifteen. Anyway, so if I use a hashtag and then. Someone else in I don't know, let's say New Zealand is sharing our hashtag. Then they start slowly. People start retweeting and favoriting, and then that's how it starts creating, you know, this little chain where everyone starts looking at what's going on in our. Like for example, let's say I'm having a action in my in my city, and I use the hashtag. Then Francis or Kendall, they might be in in um, New York or in. Um, St. Louis, but they'll see what's going on because of my hashtag. And, you know, we always have little clips or we're, we're always sharing something that's going on in our cities or what we're doing. Yeah, like with social media, you have to go where the people are. And where are the people? On social media. So we use the social media to, like, yeah, really get with the people. That's where we connect on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Show Me 15 has something on all of those things. Facebook, show, I mean Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, we're on all of those uh, media sites. Yeah, and I agree with what Francis and Angie said. I mean, I think, you know, uh, and, and just to the point about putting people in the streets, we actually have figured out how to use social media to put people in the streets and to make sure that, uh, you know, we're constantly uh, figuring out ways to broaden out the camp. Like, people are online these days. People get their news online these days. People are on all these uh, social media outlets. So, uh, and then, you know, I just think the real thing on this campaign has been the campaign has grown so fast and it is so big 
that, like 320 cities across the U.S. plus 40 countries outside the U.S. Uh, the internet is one of the many ways that we can actually wrap our hands around this campaign and make sure that everybody can coordinate so that you can be in China and you can still talk to Angie in LA or Francis in uh, St. Louis or Nequasia in North Carolina or Jarrell in New York uh, all by just staying on your computer and you know when what's happening when and then people are constantly retweeting and reposting people's stuff like Angie said and it just helps with momentum and it helps get the story out further so that people know what's happening on the campaign. And how do you make sure that people think supporting you online isn't enough? You, you said you've gotten really good at getting people to move from learning about you on social media to showing up. How do you do that? It's all about what you ask people to do, you know, is what I would say. You know, sometimes you ask people to post uh, or you ask people to, you know, retweet or whatever the case. And what we figured out how to do is we figured out a ladder and a way to ask people to actually uh, get into the streets and show their support with their feet is what I would say on my end. Yes, that's about what it is. That's that's what it is. You, um, well, me personally, I use Twitter, and I uh, when when I when we're having an action here in St. Louis. I'm tweeting to everybody I know. I post it on Facebook, and I'm asking them if if you even if you don't support the movement, support me. Come out and support what I'm doing in my life. Support what I'm doing. So that pretty much works. Just asking. I mean, you have to you ask. That's what you have to do. You have to ask people to engage in what you're doing. Angie, did you want to add anything on that or? Well, um, I just agree with them. You know, like if I share, let's say I share, a video, that's one share, you know, and then slowly everybody starts sharing. You know, it, it's all a matter of of believing and asking. Awesome. I would say. I'm going to pull up some of these pictures of um, that show some of the um, some of the props, like these giant these weather balloons. Can you all see those on the mm -hmm. on the screen? These weather balloons and um, yes, and these glowing 15 numbers and um, statues nice. and. And this thing, like the old carnival thing, where you hit the hammer into the bottom and trying to get up to 15. Um, can you talk a little bit about when you when you're planning actions, um, when you decide to use props and who makes them and how does all that work? Well, here in St. Louis, um, um, our staff, the the staff here normally does. Um, our props. So I want to say thank you, Emily and Annie, for our props here in St. Louis. Um, we just built an arch, and as the uh, viewers can see behind me, it's all kinds of stuff. That 15 behind me, we have a real giant 15 that we that we uh, anytime that we go out, we take the big one five. It goes just about everywhere that we go and um, we had a banner of balloons for uh, one for one strike and um, worker used uh, stencils to, to make our size. We use special stencils to make most of our uh, artwork but yeah here in St. Louis we have to thank Annie and Emily uh, a lot for our uh, for our props. How about in LA, Angie? Angie, can you hear us? Let's see, it looks like her screen might have frozen there. Let's see if we can get that back. Oh, there, Angie, can you hear us now?
Okay, Angie, are you able to hear? Are you able to hear us? Yeah, I can hear you now. Well, there we go. Um, can you talk about some of the props you use in LA and who who makes them and how do you decide which ones to use? Well, um, most of our props, uh, as the workers, we we do them. For example, when we do uh, the banners, we get a projector, we project it on the wall, and then we put our banner, and then we just trace, kind of like a stencil. And then most of our posters, believe it or not, they're made in the car while we're driving to actions. And, well, we reuse them, so that's pretty cool. And then, well, we do the, we use the big balloon, the purple one and the green one you saw there, those are ours. They're pretty cool, uh, but they're super heavy, so, yeah. Never again am I going to hold that balloon again. <laughs> 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 and, uh, that balloon we usually use it at our big actions, you know, in the day of action. In the day of action, uh, just because there's a lot of people and we're trying to grab people's attention, making sure that no matter no matter where people are coming from, they're gonna see our balloons and where we are. And um, well, we have as well, you know, like those represent us. And we, we, like I said, our banners make sure our banners have our hashtag. And um, well, our banners and our posters. Our posters usually talk about um, the the issue we're going for at a store. You know, like for example, like I said, one of our coworkers uh, she didn't get her paid sick days, so we make sure that our posters talked about paid sick days, or you know, something that connects to the issue. Great. We've got a couple questions coming in about the role of unions in supporting the fight for 15 and, and, and how much union becoming unionized is a goal um, for the workers of the campaign. Um, can we all talk about, can you, I have you all talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, the, the, the demands are, you know, they have two demands, $15 and a union. So they're asking for $15 an hour pay rate at least, and they're asking for the right to be in an organization. Uh, you know, the word union, I think, may not mean and look like your grandfather's union, but what these workers are, are really saying is that they want to be a part of an organization uh, that they can create change. I, I would say, you know, Angie and Francis can speak for themselves, but overwhelmingly, most workers that I've talked to around the country would already say that they are a part of a union. If the definition of a union is workers coming together to create change, I would say that the fast food workers are the definition of a union because they have created change on a level that uh, people have not seen uh, in their lifetime. You know, the idea that every Democratic candidate will be talking about 15 because fast food workers have been going on strike. Uh, the idea that someone like Governor Cuomo would dust off a system like the wage board and figure out how to how to make sure fast food workers get fifteen dollars and then double back and push for a statewide bill for fifteen for everyone you know california you know uh, there's so many examples uh inside and outside the country but i you know i think that these workers will say that they have a union but if you're talking about in the technical uh legal sense of the word then that's what they're fighting for to push mcdonald's to give them the right to be in an organization. And as far as the role of unions in this movement, I mean, there are, there have been a huge ally in the movement. There at, I would say, if you look nationally, you know, add up what's at every table in all these 320 cities, we probably have every union in the country involved in the fight for 15 in one way or another. Um, and their role is they're, they're a strong partner. You know, they put their, bring their members out on the strike line uh, their members are, you know, look, we have union members that make less than $15, and now uh, workers like the LA Unified School District, they're, you know, they went up to 15 You know, you have uh, nursing home workers in Florida that were making 8 or $9 who went up to 15 You have all these union members who have figured out how to ride the momentum of non-union workers in order to get better contracts instead of union workers setting the standards that non-union workers are uh, trying to rise to. Now you have non-union workers creating activity 
that union members are actually benefiting from. And I think that's because of the alliance on the ground. It's not about if you're in a union or if you're not. It's about if you're part of the 64 million and what these workers have been able, able to deal with. Great. Anyone else want to jump in on that? <laughs> no from Angie. What about you, Francis? I think I'm a poor yeah, No. <laughs> no, thank you. Okay. Um, we have a great question about how can people support you? How can um, people support? I'm going to bring up our last slide, which just has a general um, info address. Somebody, Francis, is asking for your Twitter hashtag because of um, <laughs> what you were saying about tweeting. So, um, what can, how can, um, uh, what's the next step for people who want to connect and support the campaign? And, and, you know, even they might be in different cities from you. What's the best way for people to plug in? Uh, well, oh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I didn't really, I was going to ask. I didn't really hear what she said. Oh. Well, um, like Kendall said, we were, we're um, all across the country. <clears throat> um, I'm sure there's going to be an action somewhere near you. So you could go to, you could go to those, or you could just, you know, simply retweet one of our tweets, you know, read our articles and share them. You could, you could just join us, you know, you could, I mean, there's so many ways you could just support us, you know, like, like, you could retweet, you could share our Facebook, um, you could do our Instagrams, um, you could go to our actions, but make sure you use our hashtag because, you know, if you don't retweet and not use our hashtag, then sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the simplest way for folks to get in contact with us is to Google Fight for 15, uh, and they'll be able to find the Facebook and the Twitter, and they can always go to www.fightfor15.org uh, to find us also. And if, uh, you know, and if you're in uh, any of the major cities in the U.S., then you can actually find the local Fight for 15 campaign by, by Googling also. Or going to the this is, Sorry, Francis. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is how you can help Francis. Can you see that? <laughs> yes. And this is us here in St. Louis, the uh, at Show Me 15, underline Me 15. That's the St. Louis chapter. Awesome. Uh, but, just to reiterate, if people really want to do the most helpful thing, find Come what out. is happening and get in the streets. Like we, any support we're going to accept, but if people want to know what will really help these workers win, then get into the streets, find the action and get in the streets and come out and help. Terrific. We, um, we're we already past our time a little bit. We had a couple questions we couldn't get to. There's one that I wanted to run by you in kind of a short form, and then we'll let you go. Um, I know that um, that fast food workers are are a huge part of this fight, fast food workers like Angie and Francis, but that you're also working with home health care workers and child care workers and lots of other folks. And someone was asking about um, contract workers who might be misclassified, like nail salon workers. I'm just wondering who, who are the people that you're reaching out to now in the campaign or who are reaching out to you um, that, that are going to be kind of new growth areas for the movement? I mean, all those industries and workers are involved. Um, I mean, it's everyone, fast food workers, home care workers, child care workers, adjunct professors, tenure professors, convenience store workers. I'm looking at Angie and Francis. I'm going to miss somebody. Uh, we've had Uber drivers reach out to us. We've had construction, non-union construction workers reach out to us. We've had, I mean, every, just about every major industry of low-wage workers in the country is involved either in every every city we're in or some of the cities we're in. There's not really a group of low-wage workers that I can think of off the top of my head that's not already represented somewhere or everywhere by the Fight for 15. This is the movement for the 64 million workers in this country who are making less than $15 an hour, which is almost half the workers in this country. 
and they're figuring out everyday ways to get uh, involved in this campaign. And I think as you know, we get closer to whatever the next big national activity is that that uh, you know the leaders on the campaign figure out. I think you're going to be surprised. But you know, frankly, we don't want to let everything out the bag on the webinar. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we, we want the movement to keep surprising us too. Absolutely. Well, Angie and Francis and Kendall, thank you all so much to our audience. Thank you so much to Kyle and Emily and Shannon and other people behind the scenes and my team at Stan who helped push the invitation out. Everybody, thank you all so much for making this possible today. I have learned a lot and I'm, I'm excited to, to know your stories and, and walk away with some of the lessons and um, yeah, just thank you so much for Angie, Francis, and Kendall for all the, all the time and thought and all your work on this movement. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Make sure to follow us. <laughs> yes, follow us. <laughs> follow us. Here we are. Follow us. Right on. <laughs> thank you all. Good day to everybody. You too.